little more about Trump now. Peter Matthews is a professor of political science at Cyprus College. He joins us from Los Angeles. Good to have you with us. Let's go back to that speech, that inaugural speech. What did you make of it? Very unusual. Uh, most inaugural speeches have very high, lofty ideas that are quite general and appeal to everyone and talk about unity. But in this case, I think Trump's speech was uh, it dealt with ideas that were anchored in the dismal reality of the working middle class and the working poor who have lost a lot of uh, ground in the last 10 years or so, or even longer than that. And Trump appealed to them directly, and he had specific proposals about, and even, even characterized it as saying that Washington has forgotten the American people. The Washington elites and establishment have won, and the American people have lost, so to speak. So he actually used a populist, class-oriented, but mostly nationalism. He said, America first. He's going to rebuild the middle class in America. And this is something to be concerned about. I mean, it's certainly understandable why people responded to that. But I think the way to fix some of these problems around the world, or in our own country, is to have the middle class grow around the world. So he wants to also renegotiate, renegotiate NAFTA, for example. And I think the way he should do it is to encourage uh, higher wages in Mexico, higher environmental standards that would match more of the United States standards, and that way there'd be fair trade. But I think he's more of a protectionist. We've got to watch out for that. And at the same time, the inaugural speech was very unusual in that sense that he really focused on quite a bit of the negative that was going on in the country at this time, as he did during the campaign, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was quite a combative speech, saying that everything's broken in America and it needs fixing. I mean, especially when he had three former presidents sitting right behind him. Quite amazing, isn't it? Because those three presidents were in office during those years that he's claiming this thing mm. happened. But there really are a lot of people suffering. The question is, he should have focused a bit more on how to bring people together mm. to fix this problem, rather than having it one group against the other. And I think that it's going to be a very interesting next four years, especially since he has a Republican Congress, some of whom don't agree with these ideas. That's very interesting. His own party, some of them don't agree with it. Others do. So you may have to bring on board some of the Democrats. And you know, there's certain a slight amount of Bernie Sanders message in this kind of speech that the middle class has lost out, the gap between rich and poor has grown considerably. And to fix the economy, to fix the middle class, to bring it back, you have to fix the, the give more money in the people's hands while working so they can go out and buy the products and have a better life in the middle class lifestyle. I mean, with all these big promises so to fix effective. people's lives, I mean, he's based his whole campaign on that. He won the presidency based on those promises. Can he actually deliver? Well, that only depends on if he's able to get Congress to work with him. And for that, you have to have a certain type of approach, and that is a, a consensus approach, a compromise approach, willing to work with other people and not think you can do it on your own, because the president cannot do it on his own. Even Donald Trump can't do it on his own. He has to bring aboard a lot of the other members of Congress of both parties, and to get the American people activated to, for a positive agenda in this sense. At the same time, not alienating some of the folks who were in power the, earlier. They, ha they have to be uh, brought along as well, if possible. But he's going to rely mostly on the working people. And he's got to bring the two parties together for this kind of change. I don't think he can do it on his own. Absolutely not. Peter Matthews, great to speak to you. Thanks for joining us there from Los Angeles. Major economic reform that's needed right now. He's been, oh, he's been campaigning on getting more jobs. And this is going to be a real focus for him. And the first 100 days, by the way, is a honeymoon period. And that's when presidents have goodwill, usually from the other party itself. But and there's a little exception. It's not quite that way yet. But still, in this case, Trump has to take the first 100-day initiative to get a lot of those things done, like infrastructure spending, job creation, trade. He said we're going to stop our jobs from being exported to other countries, cheap labor countries. Those are key priorities uh, for him. And he better capitalize on this first 100 days of whatever goodwill he has which is not a whole lot, because don't forget, he's only got a 40% approval rating right now, yeah. which is the lowest of modern-day presidents. But I think he'll have his best shot right now to try to accomplish those things. Well, Peter Matthews is a professor of political science at Cypress College in California and author of Dollar Democracy. Morning to you, Peter. Good morning. How are you doing, Claire? Very, very well. Now, listen, let's talk about uh, Theresa May going over as early as next month to visit. Uh, he will then be President Trump, won't he, of course. Um, how important That's is right. that relationship to him, do you think? How close is the relationship, did you say? Yeah, how important is it to him, his relationship oh, with the UK? It's extremely important. I mean, uh, Britain has always been considered uh, a very special relationship with the United States, starting with way back in our culture and our history, but also World War II. After World War II, in the security alliances, Britain was a leader with the US, with NATO, and not to mention uh, the Lend-Lease Act during the war. A lot of things are very special between Britain and the United States. So Mr. Trump would like to keep the special relationship even though Miss, uh, Mrs. May had criticized him uh, early on during the election for wanting to ban Muslims outright from the country and the statements that he made about women, she has come, come aboard now and said, this man is president now, I want to work with him. 
and I, we get along well. She, yeah. she actually flattered him and she, she gets along well with him. Yeah, so that so be a right thing. Is, is he on the front foot rather than her? I mean, you say, you know, that there has been a special relationship, but, but that's that's ancient history, isn't it? When you're talking about um, Donald Trump, he's, he's already criticised <laughs> NATO. Um, he's he's criticised a, a lot of the agencies that the US has been involved in and paid money into over the years to say, well, all yeah. bets are off now. This is a whole new era we're moving into. So does he hold the whip hand in this meeting he does actually and that's a concern because we don't know which way he might go at any given moment and we're hoping many of his advisors or some of them would be stable enough and experienced enough to rein him in and keep him in line in terms of what he needs to do to be a serious world leader and not to just you know say make statements like about china recently about meeting with you know having having taken a phone call from the taiwanese president which which to create a cause of ruckus so those kinds of things have to be really looked at carefully. Can he actually be the leader that the United States has been? and Or will he just go off and do things that are so unpredictable that uh, we don't know what that will do for the British-American relationship or, for that matter, the EU relationship with Britain or the Russian relationship with the United States? Mm. It's a lot of things at stake here. Peter Matthews, is this going to be it? A protectionist zeitgeist, a recoiling of American power? I don't think so entirely. There'll, there'll be a movement in that direction, but we can't do that entirely. And the United <coughs> States is the one number, uh, it's a global power, the superpower still, uh, extension all over the world with military bases, with diplomacy. So I don't think Trump will be able to come up with an isolationist policy, but there'll be more balancing of focus on domestic policy and having other countries take their share of the burden in foreign affairs. At the same time, we'll still be engaged with the world. I think Trump was talking about more like fair trade, not free trade, but fair trade where the terms of trade are more even. So he wants to renegotiate some of those trade agreements, like NAFTA, for example, and he doesn't, he's against TPP entirely. So it wasn't against trade or international involvement. It's a more balanced, nuanced way of doing it. Uh, now, it'll be interesting to see what Bernie Sanders' influence will be there as well, because Bernie Sanders had a tremendous groundswell of support against our job exports and outsourcing of our jobs, the gap between rich and poor. And you know, Trump is, is a right-wing populist, unlike Bernie Sanders, more of a progressive left-wing populist. But some of those ideas do come together in a sense. I just hope that Trump stays on, on message about uniting the country and not speaking about ethnic differences in a negative way or immigration bashing. I think if you could unite the country and come bring people together now in a new way of saying, this is a new era. Right? Well, staying on the subject, joining me now is Peter Matthews. He's a professor of political science at Cyprus College and joins me from Los Angeles. Good to have you on the program. Pollsters have been seriously battered and wrong globally uh, in the past 12 months. We saw the Canadian general election completely go in a different direction. Many pollsters in the United Kingdom thought that the British people would not vote to leave the European Union. So how seriously can we take the role of pollsters and the way that they are perhaps um, guessing who might win uh, the general election in the United States. Take it somewhat with a grain of salt, although we have to give pollsters some credit, but here's the reason pollsters have been off so far recently, is there are many, this is the winds of change time, and many people are upset at the status quo, and they're not normally regular voters. In the case of Brexit, many people voted for the first time, and they voted for Brexit when it wasn't predicted that they would do so. The same thing in the United States. Many voters that Trump is bringing in are new voters who don't get factored in the polls. So there could be a hidden vote there for who are dissatisfied voters, angry voters who have lost their jobs, who see no hope right now in the country. And yet Hillary Clinton has a tremendous chance to win because of the fact that she has a big machine with her. The ground game with the Democrats is superb. They have lots more money than Trump to pay people to go to the polls, to go door to door. I'm sorry, to go, to go door to door to, to get people to the polls. They can have paid volunteers to do that. Uh, part of the democratic machinery. They have President, Clinton, President Obama, President Clinton. They have Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders campaigning for her all over the country. Mm. And Donald Trump is basically himself and uh, his vice presidential running mate and a few other people and lots of volunteers. So it's very unpredictable what would happen if Trump turns out voters that don't normally vote. And a lot of them are actually Democrats who've sure. lost jobs to outsourcing. So Hillary has to hold on those people and look at the swing states. The swing states polling numbers have narrowed recently. In Florida, Hillary is winning by about 2 percent. In Pennsylvania, a very, very important state for Hillary, she's winning by 3 percent, but it was, she was up by 12 percent just a couple of weeks ago. In Michigan, it's down to a 4 percent margin of victory for Hillary, actually more than 3 percent right now after an 8 percent lead for a Peter, long time. Peter, sorry so to interrupt. Let me, just, let, let, me, let, me just, let me just come in there, Peter, sure, because sure. there's lots of things that you've hit on. Yes. And the thing is that, you know, you talk about these polls and, you know, up and down uh, as they have been uh, across the states. Much is being made yes. of early voting 
and people that have voted very early, but also much is being made of those that are yet undecided and will go to the polls on November the 8th. How important are that group of people and how large are they according to pollsters? The group that has not, who has not decided yet is between 5 and 8 percent. And that is significant because it only takes a few of them in one state or two states, such as Pennsylvania or Florida, to switch sides and then the other side wins the, the electoral votes, which are huge numbers in those two large states. So that number of undecided voters is very late in the game now, and they still haven't decided yet. But they will go in there and vote, and some of them may be voters who secretly favor one candidate, but don't say that to the pollsters. That's where the unpredictability comes. They're a very important group, actually. And both sides are trying to win them over by going all over the place right now in those states. Indeed, and and very heavily. Indeed, very few is, days yeah. left. They say a week is a long time in politics. I think four mm -hmm. days certainly will. For the moment, Peter Matthews, thank you. Yeah, and, and the Republicans and indeed the president-elect Donald Trump have all said that they would like to keep some aspects of Obamacare. Which aspects do you think they should keep and why? Well, I personally think they should keep all of them and then expand on them and make the, make the United States have a comprehensive universal system like all the other countries that are civilized in the world. In Britain, for example, you have the NHS, you have uh, single-payer health care in Canada, Medicare for all. We need to have something like that over here, and I think that if they do keep some of those uh, portions of it, they must at least keep the part that says that no insurance company can kick you off the plan just because you have a pre-existing condition, and also that young people who are on the age, under the age of 26 can remain on their parents' insurance until they're 26 years old. These are all very incremental steps that Obama uh, took. And in my book, Dollar Democracy, I say in the chapter on health care, I call Obamacare a small step in the right direction. It should have been expanded to a public option or a single-payer type of nonprofit medical insurance system, as in Canada, Medicare for All, as we have here for the elderly. That would be the way to go, in my opinion. But seeing Republicans, the majority, and Donald Trump coming in as a Republican president, it's going to be very tough for anyone to get anything done in that direction. So more than likely, we'll start to see some cuts in Obamacare and some real revisions to it. Not entirely, though. Well, you mentioned the NHS here in the UK. I mean, we're very used to the idea of universal health care here. It seems like a no-brainer to us. Why has yeah. Obamacare been so controversial in the US? Because mainly of the lobbyists, the various wealthy uh, lobbying groups that donate money to campaigns to members of Congress to get elected with their money. And then they owe these lobbyists something, the health insurance industry lobbyists. The, uh, so it used to be the American Medical Association at one time used to be against it. The universal health care. They were lobbyists, lobbyists from the pharmaceutical companies, the drug companies, all these very special interest groups that were able to keep away a concept of universal health care and to vilify it as being socialized medicine. Well, frankly, most of our allies have socialized medicine or some forms of it, as Canada does, and it works very well. Those countries, like Britain and Canada, have longer life expectancy than the United States people itself. We have shorter life expectancy. We have larger rates of infant mortality here in this country than in other countries. And we have uh, other kinds of problems that the outcomes of which are a result of not having universal health care. Even with Obamacare today being implemented, about 30 million Americans, 20 million Americans are left uncovered. And if, this, if the Republicans repeal the entire Obamacare, 20 million Americans who actually receive coverage will lose their coverage as well. So a total of 15 million Americans that should actually be covered fully are only partially covered now, and about 30 more million would lose their coverage entirely. And that's not good at all for anyone. It make all of us, even those of us who have health care, even more in jeopardy of our health when people around us are not healthy. And it's just not a humane thing to do. So that's why I would urge President Donald Trump to go in the other direction and say, look, let's expand it, make it efficient, single-payer, non-profit health insurance, as in Canada, as we have for the elderly here, lower overhead costs, no deductibles, no co-payments, and people will go see the doctor more regularly and get preventive care and live longer. And that would be the way to go for America. Yeah, indeed. We'll have to wait and see exactly how long it takes and exactly what happens. For now, though, Peter Matthews, great to talk to you. Thank you for joining us here on Sky News. Let's talk to Peter Matthews. He was the Democratic Party's nominee for the U.S. Congress in 1998. And he's also the author of Dollar Democracy. He's joining us now live from Los Angeles. Thank you very much indeed for your time, sir. Alan was talking about the, the, the money men and the influence that they have in terms of the Republican Party. But this is also relevant to the D Democrats as well. Give us some indication of how you think the, the, the big money, as it were, for the remaining few weeks of this campaign is going to move in terms of both the Democrats and the Republicans? Yes, very interesting. There's a big difference in the two sides because on the Republican side, 
the candidates have to raise private money, big money, from corporate PACs and also from super PACs and donors. But on the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders, the candidate who's challenging Hillary still, has a tremendous base of donors of over 7 million donations, and he's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars already, at least over $100,000, and he still keeps getting the money coming in, so he can actually last a lot longer than Ted Cruz could, because Ted Cruz had a very devastating loss today, over double digits, and he uh, is dropped out, as you know. So I think it's different on the Democratic side, because Bernie Sanders has vowed to go all the way through the, through the conventions, all the way into the convention, and even take it to a floor fight, because his ideals are important for him and his followers, and Hillary has to bring those Bernie followers over if she can. Many of them are very skeptical because they, they believe in no money in politics. They want private small money, small donors like themselves, not the big corporate donors that Hillary has taken. This has to be worked out in mm. some way or the other. But it is a different Pe scene on the Democratic side than the Republican side. Yeah, but Peter, I wanted to ask, I mean, Sanders has made a significant impact on this campaign not least because he was competing against Clinton, but also in many ways he seems to have been setting the agenda for many of the discussions that were going on uh, in, in during the campaign. And also the fact that he, if I understand correctly, he at one point in March raised $44 million on his own. I think Clinton at the time only raised 21.9. I'm sure you're more across the figures than I am. Yes. Give me an indication. Those figures the, are correct. Well, give me an indication where you think Sanders is going to, what role Sanders is going to play in the event that Clinton does make the presidency? Well, let's first backtrack a bit. Clinton has to still win 2,383 delegates, including her pledge delegates and super delegates, because by the pledge delegates alone, she's going to fall short of the 2,383. And Sanders, so will Sanders. So it looks like the key players are going to be the super delegates, and Sanders is going to make a very big pitch the superdelegates saying, I'm the stronger candidate. The polls are showing me ahead of Trump, far ahead of Trump, whereas Hillary is much closer. And I saw one poll where Hillary is actually tied with Trump right now. So Sanders is going to try his best to say, we brought new people in. We can activate excitement among the Democrats which and the independents. I can even win Republican votes, Sanders will say, as he has in Vermont before. And he'll portray himself as a stronger candidate that can take on Trump and defeat him. And he'll say that Hillary has too many weaknesses. Of course, that's to be expected that he's going to say that. The question is, will the delegates buy it? Well, joining me now for more on the bill is Peter Matthews. He's a professor of political science at Cypress College in Los Angeles. Uh, professor, thank you very much for joining us. Now, uh, explain to us, what does this bill actually mean? Because the 9-11 Commission report back in 2004 found no evidence that the Saudi government as an institution or senior officials individually funded the organization. That's correct. It's called the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, or JASTA. It was passed unanimously by the U.S. Senate. And what the bill means is, if it does become law, is that American citizens can sue foreign governments that sponsor terrorism on their soil, on our soil. So it's a very serious bill because President Obama has threatened to veto the bill. He says it will complicate international law because if that can happen, then uh, it could happen in the opposite direction as well. That the U.S. government could get sued by foreign nationals who are victims of, uh, say, what you call collateral damage in a drone strike, for example, where they, the families, innocent families get killed by a military action of the U.S. So Obama is very loath, loath to have this pass, and yet the Senate's unanimous vote indicates that when the House gets it, it'll probably pass by a large number of votes, in which case the president's veto will, be, uh, will not be sustained. It'll actually be overridden, and it'll become law anyways. It's a very tricky situation right now. Very, a precarious one between U.S. and Saudi relationships. Let's talk about those relations. We're talking about uh, up to $750 billion in assets. Um, that could be potentially sold. Yes, that's what the Saudi government has threatened to do if this act becomes law. And that's a lot of money that the Saudis will unload, that they've lent the U.S. government, and it'll create a lot of uh, havoc with the markets and with uh, the fiscal policy. So we're looking at some serious ramifications if this bill does pass. Yet you can understand that many Congress members are very uh, concerned about voting against an act like this, which seems to have such popular support. It sounds like it's the victims of the 9-11 attacks that are do some justice. By the way, in 2005, the victims of the 9-11 families did take court action, and the judge ruled in a district court here in the United States that the Saudi government was not liable, that it was, in fact, not allowed to be a defendant. It's not going to be a defendant in the actual action because the act doesn't apply to it. It said, the judge said this action originated outside the United States, and therefore, the Saudi government was not culpable 
in any way or even be able to be sued by the, uh, the victim of the family. So that ruling in 2005 was the beginning, the, the first shot in this direction. Again, in 2015, when the court case came up again, a judge ruled in the opposite direction, saying that, yes, the victim's families can sue the, the Saudi government or any other government that uh, sponsors terrorism, if it does. Let's get more on the story. We're joined by Peter Matthews, who's professor of political science and author of Dollar Democracy with Liberty and Justice for Some, joining us from Los Angeles in California. Many thanks for joining us, Peter. Uh, I believe some of these electoral uh, college voters have even received death threats. I mean, what are the chances that these electors will vote their own way and go against the mandate of the people in their state? I think the chances are quite small, actually. They'll need 37, 37 electors, Republican electors, to switch over to the Democratic side, Hillary, and for her to be able to win this uh, over Trump. And I think only one, uh, one Republican elector has come out publicly. He's from Texas and said that he's not going to be supporting Trump. He's the only so-called faithless elector. But we've got to go back to the history a little bit. Alexander Hamilton, one of the founders, in Federalist Paper Number 68, he set up the reason for the Electoral College. He said that in case the public chooses the wrong person out of misinformation or whatever, a passion, that a group of selected people, selected by the, the leaders of the country, would be able to actually vote for the presidency and make a much more reasoned judgment. Now, that's, that'll go down very hard with the Trump supporters if the electors switch over and vote for Hillary. Although Hillary won 3 million more votes, approximately 3 million more votes than Donald Trump, popular votes, the way the system is set up, the electoral votes are the only ones that count. And it's based on per state electoral count. So the smaller states, the rural states, actually have the numerical advantage because each state has two senators, for which there are two electors, in addition to the House electors, and it doesn't matter what population the state has. So the states that are smaller in number have more numbers of electors in the Electoral College than their population would warrant. So it does have a small bias toward the rural states and smaller states where Donald Trump did very well, actually. It's, it's a very big conundrum right now, but I don't think it's going to be switching over and, and flipping to, uh, Donald, to Hillary Clinton. Uh, that's that's my educated guess. You don't know what could happen. Uh, okay, uh, but no. looking ahead, I mean, given we've seen this sort of discrepancy happen, uh, do you think that we could see the entire system change? Because there have been calls for it to be scrapped. Oh, absolutely. In fact, it's happened twice. When Al Gore was not elected, uh, although he got more popular votes, and again this time, within 20, less than 20 years, it's happened twice. And there have been many calls to just abolish the Electoral College. And I believe that would be a good move, and I think that we may see some movement here. We'll take a constitutional amendment, which means that uh, two-thirds of the House and the Senate have to vote for the amendment to propose it, and three-fourths of the states have to ratify it. That's the main way of doing it. So that's also a tough call, but a lot of popular pressure now. The majority of Americans actually want to abolish the Electoral College, about a little over 50 percent say they should abolish it and let the people decide. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. This is probably the only one election which brought the, this whole issue of the Electoral College uh, to the forefront like no other election before. For tonight's Conversations with Great Minds, I'm joined by one of America's leading progressive voices, political scientist Peter Matthews, currently a professor of political science at Cypress College and adjunct professor of sociology at Long Beach City College Peter is a political analyst and a radio talk show host in addition to being an academic. He's also seen how the political system works from the inside. In 1988, he was the Democratic nominee for Congress from the district surrounding Long Beach, California. Peter's new book, The Dollar Democracy with Liberty and Justice for Some, How to Reclaim the American Dream for All, is a must-read expose of how our government has been hijacked by big money. Peter Matthews, welcome. It's great to be here with you, Tom. How are you doing tonight? I'm well, and thank you for joining us from our Los Angeles studio. I'd like to start with you, Peter. You're a professor of political science, radio host, former congressional candidate, activist. What would you say is the guiding principle in everything you do, and how did you first get into politics or interested in politics? Well, you know, um, I was actually a psychology major in college, and when I went to Europe and I saw the Berlin Wall, that changed everything. So I crossed over into East Germany and talked to the people there and asked how they lived. And, Pretty soon I started to recognize there were a lot of walls around the world, you know, and the walls between rich and poor, between men and women, between uh, different ethnicities. And I, I, I took some classes in international relations and uh, uh, world politics when I got back to college that summer. And I said, this is the field I need to try to explore more. So I went ahead and double majored in psychology and political science to find out more about economic development, exploitation, neo-imperialism over the time, and imperialism itself. So it was very interesting to me. I've traveled to 27 countries to actually 
find a way to reduce those walls and create more justice, Tom. Equal opportunity and equal justice for all is, to me, my, my basic uh, goal in life to help with that. You've, you've written a book called Dollar Democracy uh, with Liberty and Justice for Some. In fact, uh, there, here's the book. Uh, tell us about yes. the book. Why did you decide to write it? Well, I decided to write the book because I was noticing that many of my students were having increasingly difficult time making it through college. And it wasn't their fault whatsoever. In California, we had tuition-free education from the 1960s to the 1980s until the elites took it away by giving corporate tax loopholes to oil companies and other big businesses. And in, the, in turn, they took, went ahead and cut the subsidies for public education and universities and colleges and started raising the tuitions by several hundred percent. And my students couldn't make it. They had to drop out and go work full time and go to school part time. So their dream was being, their American dream was being delayed and in many cases completely taken away. And I thought this was totally unjust, not just in education, but in every single area of our lives, policy areas, in health care, in the environment, in our food supply, in the Wall Street crash, in every one of those areas, you see the hand of dollar democracy, Tom, where $6.2 billion was raised and spent in 2012 alone on federal candidates. This year, it'll even be more. And this started before super PACs. It started before Citizens United, when, when the biggest corporations bought both parties, including much of the Democratic Party, not all of it, We've got exceptions like Senator Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and other grassroots people like Senator Wellstone who refused corporate money and won the right way. But the majority of Democrats and almost all the Republicans have been bought at the federal and state level, and our middle class is suffering, and so is our country, and we cannot survive without a middle class. You know, Aristotle said that, Jefferson said it, we all know it. Yeah. So that's what happened. I wrote the book for that reason. Is, is that yeah. what you mean when you say dollar democracy, basically democracy that's been bought and paid for? It's been bought and paid for and through the areas of election financing as well as lobbying. Don't forget the lobbying part. In many cases, lobbying consumes even more money where these corporations take legislators on vacation, working vacations to Hawaii, for example. That was done with our California state legislators by the energy and pharmaceutical and oil companies for vacation in Maui to discuss issues such as oil taxes or the lack thereof. So these lobbyists have bought and paid in election campaigning as well as lobbying our Congress and our elected leaders from City Council on up. And I believe the way to turn it around is to go through several things, public financing of elections as they have in Maine and Arizona.